So welcome uh, everybody to the second in our series of Frank Davis Memorial Lectures this term. My name is Tom Nixon and together with my colleague Stefania Gerovini, I am uh, convening this series of lectures this uh, term which address questions of light and darkness from a number of different perspectives, uh, disciplinary perspectives, perspectives from uh, practitioners, from scholars, um, from uh, um, uh, scholars of, of art history, anthropologists, uh, and so forth. Um, and tonight, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Anthony McCall. Before I introduce our uh, speaker tonight, I'd just like to uh, advertise the next um, in this series of lectures, which will be on Tuesday the 22nd of November, um, at the same time in this room. Uh, and there we have uh, an anthropologist Mikhail Bieler, coming from Copenhagen, who will be talking about um, light and darkness and gloom um, from an uh, anthropological perspective. Um, uh, gloom in a lighting sense, I think it should be cheery. This seems very nice. Um, uh, the Frank Davis Memorial Lectures, as we've conceived it, is an opportunity to really um, uh, challenge us to think about uh, questions of light and darkness in different ways. Um, certainly already today, um, some of us have had that. Um, um, many people in this room will have um, seen Anthony McCall's line describing a cone, um, uh, his sort of seminal uh, work of 1973, which was uh, screened downstairs. I uh, have also uh, had a very kind of new experience today in the sense of I'm a medievalist, really. Um, uh, this, most of today I've spent up a ladder uh, putting up masking tape and blackout over the, bli over the lights in our research forum so that we would have total blackout. Normally, well, the last time I think I was up a, a ladder for research purposes, I was uh, on the exterior of Toledo's Gothic Cathedral measuring the, the heights of, of masonry uh, courses. So certainly for me already, this series has been a, a very uh, new uh, experience and I hope it will uh, uh, challenge and provoke you to think about light and darkness very differently. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce tonight uh, our speaker, Antti McCall. Um, Antti was born in England, but now and for a long time has lived in Manhattan and is best known really for his solid light installations, or have come to be known as solid light installations, a series that began in 1973 with his line describing a comb. Uh, in which a volumetric form composed of projected light slowly evolves in dark three-dimensional space. And that's something that uh, many of us witnessed uh, earlier this afternoon. Occupying a space between sculpture, cinema and drawing, McCall's work's historical importance has been recognised in exhibitions such as Into the Light, the Projected Image in American Art, 1964 to 77, at the Whitney Museum of American Art. That was in 2001 and 2. The expanded screen, actions and installations of the 60s and 70s at the Museum of Moderna Kunst in Vienna in 2003 and 4. The expanded eye uh, in Zurich in 2006. Uh, Beyond Cinema, the art of projection in uh, Berlin in 2006 and 7. And the cinema effect, illusion reality in the projected image at the Hirschhorn Museum in Washington in 2008. Um, uh, Anthony, I believe, has uh, another show on in Melbourne uh, later this year or next year. I think we might talk about that. Um, uh, but for now, he's going to talk to us about Solid Light Dark Room. So please join me in welcoming Anthony McCall. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, Tom and uh, Fania, for inviting me to do this uh, lecture in this very distinguished institution. Um, I started using the term solid light in 1973, um, and it referred really to a paradox, that my shaped planes of light made visible by the dust in the air or a few cigarette smokers um, resembled walls. And these walls presented surfaces that asked to be touched. At the time, the work was generally seen as belonging to a, a movement known as expanded cinema, which explored the use of multiple screens and performance uh, in distinction to the um, Hollywood theatrical narrative, which had you know, fixed rows of seats and one projection booth and a fixed screen. Um, 
A solid light film is based on simple enough elements, um, an empty darkened room, a projector, a haze machine, um, a temporal structure, and so on. But these elements have to be arranged in relation to one another in a very specific way for the pieces to come into being. It's these um, special arrangements that um, I would like to discuss this evening. Yes, um, a, a solid light film is based on a simple enough uh, set of elements, and which we've discussed. And um, forgive me, I'll be that really. And I'd like to begin by describing two of the earliest projected works when the solid light idea was born. This is an early installation of view of line describing a cone, the first solid light work made in 73. Uh, what this photograph shows very clearly is that we, the audience, have turned our backs onto the screen and are looking toward the projector. And we are paying attention to a conical plane of light that's gradually coming to being in three-dimensional space. But on the wall that we've turned our backs on is a 30-minute animated line drawing that's slowly forming a circle. The conical object encloses a large conical volume, which is capable also of incorporating spectators. Um, and um, this photograph is taken at about the 24th minute of the 30-minute piece. So you can see it closing down the bottom. Um, and being a sculptural form, it displaces and occupies real three-dimensional space. The idea grew out of some cinematic questions. Um, you know, in a movie, the events depicted by definition have already happened. They happened in the past. Um, and um, the events depicted also have happened elsewhere. They don't happen in the movie theater, they happen somewhere else. And um, with line describing a cone, I was simply trying to make a film which would exist in a space um, that was shared with the audience, the actual same physical space, and also would occupy the same present tense as the audience. This is a film made a year later. This was a long film for four projectors, 74. Um, and instead of a single object in space, um, the arrangement of projectors produces a field of four blades of light. And the four blades of light repeatedly sweep through the space and through one another. Um, and in such a way that if you're, in the if you're in the room, you're in the film. The only way to not be in the film is to leave. Um, each reel of film has 16 parts built around four different speeds, four different frequencies of light from uh, glimmering, blinking, flashing, solid, so on. And um, the exhaustion of all the permutations produced a work that lasted five and a half hours. So this is, the, uh, this is a drawing showing, which shows the spatial field. And you can see how the spectator is incorporated into the room. Um, and thanks to the five and a half hour cycle, people visit the work rather than experiencing it as a member of an audience. Um, each individual now decides how long to stay. Uh, and of course, uh, this is what we'd now call an installation. Um, um, and since making long film, I've preferred this type of omnidirectional field together with the idea uh, of a continuous temporal structure, which then creates a different kind of vi uh, audience. It's called a visitor and the visitor decides how long they're going to stay and what they're going to do while they're there. So this is the first of my um, elements, haze. And I put it first because one of the reasons I stopped making these works uh, after doing the first set in the 1970s is because I discovered that the work was invisible uh, if it was shown in a, in a modern museum. The reason being, unbeknownst to me, I had a medium I was working with, uh, which was dust. 
Um, I was working in old lofts, and the work was shown in old lofts, uh, full of dust. They'd been manufacturing um, uh, businesses for 50 years, prior to my being in them. Um, and then people always smoked. So between the cigarette smoke and the dust, they were highly visible. And I never even realized I had a visibility issue. But once I showed, it, showed the work in a new Kunsthalle, or a museum in a biennial, um, I discovered that the piece was absolutely invisible. Well, it wasn't invisible. There was an image on the screen, and there was a projector at the other end of the room, and absolutely nothing in between. So um, I put the Hayes, this uh, issue first. And um, I'm, uh, oh yes, and let's return to the old, uh, the old, uh, the photograph of the 70, in 74. This was a typical loft. You can see the rough um, floors, the open plumb, the open uh, heating pipes, uh, the rotting plaster on the walls, the freight elevator in the corner. It's very much like the loft I worked in. And uh, this um, image was taken with probably two smokers and a lot of people in the room. <laughs> Um, so now, um, in the, in the mid-90s, I became aware of the Hayes machine, um, and which was being developed for the film industry, theatre, and so on, and uh, discotheques. And um, it's become uh, absolutely central to, to, to my installations, and it, it's, it, it creates a, a fine vapour of uh, mist, really, which is mostly water vapor with a little um, glycol, and it can uh, make uh, visible uh, large-scale installations in a way that I couldn't possibly have done before. So it's become a sort of active partner, um, and when a plane of light passes through haze in the room, it becomes intensely visible. Um, and a happy side effect is that it also, in entering the, in entering the room, the haze when it hits my planes of light, it creates a kind of desultory kind of marbling effect, which is very, very effective in describing the curvatures of the, of the forms, and is sort of beautiful in itself. Drawing. Um, at the center of any solid light installation, whatever else you might think it is, or has, going for it, is a simple two-dimensional line drawing. Um, here it is on the wall at the end. Um, but then, in addition, we can see the three-dimensional form. Um, and this is a beam coming from the projector that carries the line drawing to the wall. But with the help of a haze machine, it becomes a palpable, volumetric object. Uh, this is actually called Doubling Back. It was from 2003. It was the first of the new series that I started after about a 25-year gap. And without the haze, this piece would be absolutely invisible. Um, so this was the first piece to take advantage of the haze machine. Um, and Doubling Back uh, is based on two identical waveforms. Um, you can see one... You see the mouse, yeah. This is waveform one, which moves horizontally through the frame. And this is, sorry, this is waveform two, which moves vertically through the frame. They're identical. But that movement, uh, this is a diagram which makes it clear. I use color simply to make it clear what was going on. Uh, you can see that the motion of each going through the other produces... Um, a series of shifting uh, configurations which in three-dimensional space form pockets and chambers of space which you can occupy as a visitor. Um, and this is my basic vocabulary when it comes to drawing. I've got ellipses or circles, um, straight lines and traveling waves. I've got one that I'm not illustrated here which is somewhere between a traveling wave and a circle, called a circle wave. But I haven't uh, found it necessary to, to change this syntax uh, very much, because there's so many other things going on. Um, so, next, projection. This is a fairly big category. Um, projection and the deployment of projectors is central to my installations. And 
I'd like to review five works um, from the last um, 12 years. Um, each one uses one or more projectors, uh, but they do it in quite different ways. So this is an installation view of You and I Horizontal made in 2005. This was taken at the Serpentine Gallery. I did the show there in, I think, 2007. Um, and you can see that there are two large, roughly conical-shaped forms that are sitting next door to each other, side by side, um, quite separate from one another. The spectators in the photograph have discovered that, with their back, that if they have their backs to the drawing, they get the best possible view of the volumetric form. Um, and then this one is what happens if you turn around and look in the other direction. So this business of there being these two, at least two faces to the forms, because there's far more than that in fact, but the two extreme faces are, are to, um, to be inside the volume or to be, as it were, having one's back to the volume and looking at the drawing on the wall. This particular uh, piece, um, uh, the drawing for, there's one continuous drawing with two cones, and this, um, this uh, plan from a gallery exhibition, whoops, sorry, shows uh, exactly why, because you see you've got, the, you've got the drawing here, which all joins up, and then the, um, seems to want to keep doing this, um, and then you've got the two conical, roughly conical forms forming independent shapes. This piece uh, is called Face to Face. This was made more recently in 2013. Um, and this is a plan view of a planned uh, gallery installation. Uh, now, uh, in, in the previous piece, the projectors faced the same direction and the forms were side by side. Well, the forms are still side by side here, but the projectors are facing in opposite directions. Um, also notice that uh, there are screens here. This is the only piece to date where I've used screens. Usually I just project onto the wall. Um, but what I liked about uh, using screens in this case is that it would mean that I could place a, an installation into a much larger space, which would allow not only to be, for the spectator to be absorbed within the field, but also to walk around on the outside. And, and with the screens, and they make a double-sided screen, it means that you have, um, you have uh, uh, four drawings rather than two. But first, um, having the two projectors projecting onto screens in different directions means that you can, when you stand inside one of the volumetric forms, unlike the piece we looked at just before this, you can also see the drawing. You're looking straight at it. And um, so what intrigued me about this was that you could, it's, it creates quite a sort of mind riddle because um, this person is standing inside uh, a flattened elliptical form, which is identical to the one that he's also looking at on the, on the wall. And so you have this strange thing where you know, you know that you're, this, this is a fact, but it's really difficult to convert that knowledge from two dimensions to three and back again, um, and become as part of the pleasure of um, playing around with the piece. Um, here's a better view of the whole arrangement in space. You can see the two uh, screens now, and you can see that you can see the front of the back screen and the back of the more uh, closer one. Um, they're facing each other. The screen membranes are translucent, meaning the uh, drawing is legible from both sides. So, um, just want to point something out. If I, this will let me. You see this curving form. On, the uh, on this screen, well, that curving form is exactly uh, is the mirror of the curving one on the right over there. Um, so um, you have everything there is to be known about that moment in time. You have simultaneously in the installation, even though you're going to have to walk around and find it. But they they join up. These two images join up with each other. Uh, and I'll come to why that is when we, uh, a little later on. 
This is one of my most recent pieces. It's titled Swell uh, and was made this year. And um, in it we've got, um, it's one of a, a trio of two projector works. What we're doing here is we're looking through this wall. It's a, we've, I've made the wall transparent from the point of view of the drawing. Uh, but you can see uh, there are where the projector, projectors are on the far wall, one in the top left and one in the bottom right. And they're projecting uh, onto this wall, but what they're doing is they're converging. So you end up with a drawing, and one drawing is superimposed over the other. Uh, you have one flat plane, one blade of light, and one uh, conical form, and they converge and form one image. Um, Here's the installation photograph, taken from that, the same perspective we have with the drawing, looking toward the projector. So you can see the, the bright points where the projectors are. You've got the flat blade coming toward you, and you've got the conical blade. What, what, this, um, what this did is um, it's created a kind of topographically, topologically, sorry, topologically impossible object. And uh, it turns out that the haze seems to help a kind of fudge in our perceptions because what quite unmistakably happens, you can even see it here but of course you can't quite understand it in the same way is that the flat blade comes shooting toward you it then it turns a bend and then shoots outwards up and upwards so the flat plane turns into the conical plane after doing this, performing this sort of sweeping turn um, and it was, I didn't expect this exactly, but it's, it's become clearly something I'm going to need to investigate further. Um, so far we've looked at horizontal installations, uh, but in fact, since 2004, I've made an equal number of works that are oriented uh, vertically. This is Between You and I, made in um, 2005. Um, it also uses two projectors, only this time the projectors are on the ceiling. We're in a 10 metre tall space and the projectors project downwards onto the floor. Um, so the scale is identical to the horizontal ones, they're just oriented differently. And um, the two forms sit side by side, they're about, each one is about four and, four and a half metres wide. Um, and the experience of engaging the vertical forms is quite different from that of the horizontal. Um, the connection to cinema is loosened a little bit, and the connections to sculpture seem a little more grounded. Um, for myself, I quickly found, without thinking, that I was referring to these pieces as standing figures. But the differences do go further than that. Um, one does tend to read the membranes as kinds of walls, um, and the apertures as doorways, and the spaces as chambers. And there is undoubtedly the suggestion of architecture as well, which is far less uh, pronounced in the horizontal pieces. And I'd also just like to take a look at the work that I've just completed. Um, now, this is neither horizontal nor vertical, but somewhere in between. It's, I just call them slanting works. And uh, it's, uh, this particular one is a four-projector installation. This is the one that's going to be in Australia at the end of the year. Uh, and it's titled Crossing. And this, um, this, is, a, this is a rendering. It's a drawing. Uh, of the installation. And you can see that there are, in fact, two pairs of projectors. And each pair does that convergence you saw in the last piece, where they both converge on the same uh, point of the floor. By the way, I also call, particularly since the vertical ones, I refer to the drawing as the footprint. And this is very literal in a vertical work, because you're actually walking on it. Um, and so it kind of justifies them thinking of the the volumetric form as a kind of body in space. Um, this will have its inaugural exhibition in um, December.
And this is just a more technical installation drawing, which I put in because uh, of this business of the arrangement of elements. This shows quite clearly there's all kinds of things being arranged. Um, uh, the uh, position of the of the two pairs in the main space it's it's talked slightly off 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 parallel um, you can see the four projectors hanging there uh, you can also see the haze machines in position one over there one up there um, and uh, this particular work has um, an audio component too and so you see the a set of audio speakers five of them that are hanging above head height right the way through the center of the installation. Now I'd like to move on to the structure of these works uh, in time, the temporal structure. Um, the line drawings we've been talking about are in fact always in motion. For instance, in, in uh, between you and I, uh, it's this piece, uh, the straight line very slowly ro is rotating, while the travelling wave is very slowly moving through the frame. And the elliptical form and the other form at the back there is um, expanding and contracting, rather like a lung. You know, it's like a breathing motion. Um, these are the forms that I've been working with for a time, and I, but I was looking for a way to create a more complex object. Um, you know, cinema has parallel action in which you can cut back and forth between two parallel stories. Sometimes they converge and sometimes they don't. Uh, and we have no difficulty following that with our eyes. Um, but the trouble is, with a sculptural form, um, that simply isn't legible. It's like it's, it, you just put an object there and whip it away, it just makes absolutely no sense. Um, and I found, uh, I went looking for some way to think about this, and I found, uh, I found it in a, a now archaic cinematic transition called a wipe, which had its, at its height it was in the 40s, I think, 50s, and then gradually dropped into disuse as it became clear that everyone knew what a cut was and you could easily uh, figure out what was going on. It was a kind of slow transition that would help ease, ease from one place to another or one time to another, and it would be marked by this signal called a wipe. And I'd like to show you, I hope it works, um, a brief clip from S The Seven Samurai by Kurosawa, who used, who used it quite frequently. Now let's see if we can get it to... Just look at it one more time. Um. Um, that wipe lasted, what, half a second? And in that half a second, one moving image eclipsed another moving image. Uh, and during half of that half a second, there was a continually shifting uh, relationship between the two cinematic images. And I thought these were all really suggestive ideas. And, but I thought, um, why only half a second? Why not six minutes or 16 minutes? Um, and I took my basic vocabulary and of, an, of the ellipse, the travelling wave and the straight line, and brought them together in a single wipe. So here's our ellipse, and now even before the motion of the wipe, as it were, draws, draws these together, what will happen here is that the, the elliptical form is going to compress just on the vertical axis, and then open again. Just simple movement, so it comes to about half its volume and then returns to a full volume. Um, and here we have a travelling wave bisected by a straight line. Straight line will slowly rotate while the wave passes through the frame repeatedly. Um, 
I like all these motions because they are continuous. You're presented with a continuous <laughs> sense of change, but there's no narrative development. And um, th that suits this kind, I think, suits this kind of quite abstract sculpture quite well. So, um, here is, sorry, here is a, the result of that bringing together. Um, if we look at the, this first one here, let's just take the bottom row. We start with, um, start with an elliptical form, which, as you see, it's, 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 it's uh, compressing itself, and then by the end is opened up. But the important thing is the wipe starts. And these uh, drawings are about two minutes apart. So we have a 16 minute wipe. And, so sorry. Um, and gradually the wipe brings in with it the, um, I beg your pardon, this is something peculiar going on here. Um, and brings with it the other form made of the traveling wave and the straight line. So by the end of the drawing, um, if I can find it for you, uh, by the end of the drawing, uh, we've uh, gone from the, the ellipse to the travelling wave. And the reverse has happened in this one. This one begins uh, with uh, the travelling wave and the straight line. is gradually eclipsed by the um, elliptical form until it, too, has been taken over. So in sculptural terms, what's happened, this is a side-by-side -side vertical work, sculptural terms, what's happened is that the two conical forms have changed places. And here, in real time, is a wipe undergoing um, wipe, and the forms going through their changes. This is the speed at which it works. And imagine, or remind yourselves, that you're standing on this drawing, and these changes, these these line drawing changes, are creating different. Um, architectural or spatial volumes in, in three-dimensional space. Okay, um, so we have this wipe, we have these kind of transitions. Now I'd like to just talk about speed, the speed at which things move, um, or the lack of it. Um, rapid motion in a movie is something we're very well able to handle. Um, the reason for that is um, when we're in a movie theatre, uh, we've sloughed off our body, we don't need that. And we look at a movie with our eyes and our imaginations. And we're completely used to complicated, fast cutting back and forth and speed. And, um, and in fact, it's part of the enjoyment of looking at, at a movie. Um, but um, looking at a large three-dimensional sculptural object is quite different. Um, we need our mobile bodies available to explore space, um, to understand what the form consists of. And I've, I found that if the motion of the lines and therefore the changing of the membranes uh, is too fast, then uh, our immediate reaction is to stay rooted to the spot and simply watch. And this, of course, frustrates the um, whole relationship between a piece of sculpture and its a viewer. Um, you need to walk. Uh, you need to move around an object in, through and around uh, in order to understand it. Um, but if the speed at which the changes take place is very slow, then the spectator will continue to walk and move around. So slowness turns out to be a value. And the way I think about it is um, the fastest object in the room should be the spectator.
Okay, dark rooms. Um, the effects that we've been discussing um, are dependent on the exhibition spaces being made not just dark, but absolutely dark. Uh, any form of a light intruding that isn't the piece is an intrusion and will sabotage the, the spatial effects of the, of the work. And um, the silvery translucent membranes of light are delicate. There's also a secondary problem, which is um, how do you retain the haze in the space? Because what haze does, it's like water, it finds its way out of everything. And um, left to its own devices, the haze will exit by the, wall, the, the doorways you come in and find its way all over the building and create havoc with the fire alarm system. <laughs> fire alarm systems are very dumb. They can't tell the difference between cold vapor and hot. And so I have emptied a couple of buildings in my time. <laughs> and um, you sit out there for four hours while the fire brigade check everything. Um, so these two problems, keeping unwanted ambient light out and keeping uh, the haze in, requires an actual architectural solution. It's not that simple. And that solution is called a light lock. Um, this is a sort of generic drawing showing de uh, some designs for various light locks for getting into the space without bringing the light in or letting the haze out. Um, in each, what they have in common is that I like to, when people enter the installations, I like them to come in already looking into the volumetric form. Since we have such habit for looking at screens, for looking at moving images on screens, if you entered facing the screen, many people would just stay there, look at it, shrug and leave. And so you see all of them bring, some, bring people in from the, uh, from the volume end. This was a space uh, for line describing a code at the Hay Haywood Gallery some years ago. And um, uh, you can see the same thing, the light lock that brings you in at the volumetric end. You see this box here, this is a projection box, because we gradually discovered, um, oh I should say David Lester discovered, he's a great projectionist, an artist himself, and he's actually here in the audience. Um, David discovered that the haze could have an adverse effect on the looping mechanism for a film, and proposed that we should build a sealed uh, box for it. So, which is exactly what we did. Here it is. Uh, and it has its own ventilation system. You can see the haze machine on the floor there. And it essentially keeps the, um, the, the projection separate from the projector. So that's now become something of a standard that we use. And uh, this is a generic, again, a generic plan for all kinds of installations I've actually done with digital projectors. And now, where we can, we routinely build a, a false wall at one end with about a metre or metre and a half deep corridor in there, which keeps the projectors completely independent, again, of the room with the haze. Uh, here's our light lock corridor. And um, we get in and out by, 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 by using that corridor. Um, here's, a, here's an installation view of the, remember the torqued vortex-like image? This is a, uh, a view of that installation at Nevada Museum of Art. So you see the, the, the false wall and the projectors at the back and, and the way the two projector beams converge. Um, here we also have a couple of um, uh, screens, as it were, in the middle of a very wide corridor because we found that in that case there was a chimney effect. It wanted to draw the haze out of the room. And by putting those two baffles there and a small fan, we were able to neutralize that. And so it was actually a very successful um, arrangement. And um, I've also done, uh, we've been talking really about individual installations, but I've also done a number of solo exhibitions in museum spaces that consisted of uh, a collection of several independent individual works. 
So this was a four-month show at the Hamburger Bahnhof in uh, Berlin, uh, titled Five Minutes of Pure Sculpture. And you can see uh, on the left, uh, you can see a light lock, which is here. Um, a huge light lock could bring people in from two sides. And beyond, that, beyond the light lock is just a, a, a fully lit lobby of a museum. Inside it was completely dark. Um, this is the installation view of the, of the, of the, the vertical works part of that show. Um, it was a beautiful space, once a railway station. Um, railway stations are built for maximum daylight. And this one was no exception. So preparing for the show required darkening uh, 2,000 panes of glass. To summarize, um, <coughs> solid light works are based on arrangement of elements, um, including haze, drawing, projection, temporal structure, light, slow motion, dark rooms, and the light lock corridor. Um, they, draw, they draw something from the solid light films, draw something from the discourses of both sculpture and cinema. The installations are continuous and cyclical, and visitors come and go in their own time. They take place in galleries, and museums and other cultural spaces. Well, thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Anthony, for sharing with us some insight into um, uh, the way that you've conceived these wonderful works. Um, we have a little bit of time uh, now for any questions, if anybody has them, uh, before we go downstairs where the chance to have kind of more informal questions uh, over drinks. So, yes. yes. Um, what I wanted to find clear about is how the image is on the celluloid. Is it really the celluloid You're talking about the 1970s works, right? Yeah. Well, the 1970s works were celluloid, and the, the newer ones are all digital. In the case of the film, um, well, it was a process of very simple animation. There was a line drawing, which was put on an animation stand underneath the camera. And animation requires that you shoot every frame one at a time, 24 frames a second of screen time. So it's a very laborious, slow process. But that's how. It was, uh, it's just a, a filmed. Uh, an animated film drawing. In the case of the digital works, we've switched to algorithms. You know, there's a, a set of, there's a code that's written uh, which uh, describes really what happens. And then the computer uh, reads the code and makes the forms appear. But the image is actually on the film. There's no using GoPros or anything like that. No, in the case of the 16 millimeter films, the 70s works, the images are, you can just hold it up and see it, yeah. Any others? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask if obviously the human form and the human experience is really important in your work. So, how much is the scale of the human form in relation to the scale of your works important? Um, <coughs> it's very important. And um, I started doing horizontal works, of course, and I, I always thought of the right scale as being. Uh, when you could come uh, two thirds down the cone from off the wall, and you know you could do your Vitruvian Man thing, with where the fingertips and the feet would touch the uh, di the diameter, the circumference of the circle. Uh, that's where I started, and I haven't gone very far away from that. I mean, the the images, the image on the wall is a ten meter throw, and the image on the wall is about. Uh, usually about four and a half meters. And ditto when it's vertical. And I just carried that over. And have you seen any strange effect when you deviate from that? Scale? For strange what? Sorry. Is there any different effect if you deviate from that scale? That I'm realizing or denying? Yeah, what? Do you realize or do you design for? Um, don't think Try I quite. It. I don't think I quite understand the question. Have you tried deviating from that scale? 
Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, you get okay when it goes to when it goes smaller than that. What happens is one of the one of the things that's really interesting about these forms are that they do incorporate a number of spectators at once, and that's part of the sort of it makes what makes them very different from solid sculpture. And um, if you make that volume too small, you well you just can't get anyone in there. And and if it's much bigger, then you have a physical problem of visibility. The form begins to break up and it loses its legibility as a volume. So in fact, that guesswork about the Vitruvian scale, you know, actually turned out to be uh, good for different, re but uh, the right decision, even though the negatives were other things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, agree. Because it's yeah. of our own scale and our own existence. Yes. I don't think it would be... I mean, when I do a large installation like that last one in Berlin, um, each individual form was exactly what it should be. The, the large scale of the installation came from the, having more than one and creating a, a constellation of pieces in a big space. And that seemed to work quite well. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So you sort of mentioned offhand that now you have to explore this, this, yeah. this project. And it seems to me that each individual work sort of seems like one maybe instantiation of a larger project, like maybe an exploration phase. But, and so, but you also said that it sort of comes between sculpture and cinema. Mm. But surely there's also an intervention into the architecture that, that you're exploring. And I wonder when you have this larger project, are you exploring how changing the form on the screen of the wall that you're projecting it onto will change the experience of the spectator, or how the piece itself will sort of intervene in the space? What's sort of your value? I think both and all of those. Um, of course, we only saw, we hopped across lots of works we didn't see. Uh, but generally speaking, I'm always hoping to find something, that something accidental that happens that I hadn't thought of. You know, and exp and then go on and exploiting that. So that's part of the pleasure for me. Um, and uh, that can include those the things that might pop up that were unexpected could come from anywhere. Could be to do with this change of relationship with the spectator. It might be an architectural idea. It might be simply uh, um, a development of an earlier thought. But I mean, over time they have shifted and changed, and I hope improved. Um, yeah. Yeah, Robert. You, you talked, um, you made a number of metaphorical references, kind of like film, like sculpture, like architecture. But do you ever think in terms of narrative? That's a great question. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, I, I, I mean, you can't keep narrative down for long. It comes in the back door. And uh, in fact, Line Describing a Cone is the least typical of all of the solid light films, and it is a firmly narrative film. It, at the beginning, it declares its purpose, I'm turning into a circle, and at the end of 30 minutes, it's delivered. You know, um, that is a kind of simple narrative. Um, but the way it's, it returned for me in the rest of the work was, you know, I had a 25-year hiatus from the solid light pieces. And when I um, decided absolutely that I wanted to make some more, uh, I started to look quite a lot at the early work. And I found, um, I was looking at a conical film called Cone of Variable Volume, which took the form simply of um, uh, a cone of light expanding and contracting, and there were four different speeds. It started very slowly, so you could hardly see it, and by the end it was going really fast. And, you know, uh, it was named like one named things in the 70s, it, you know, a cone of variable volume, and, uh, you know, four projected movements, long film for four projectors, very matter-of-fact descriptive names. 
Um, and I was astonished to discover when I saw this particular one. Um, I was thinking to hell with cone of variable volume, this damn thing's breathing. And it was a, quite a surprise, I couldn't possibly have uh, seen that in the 70s. But to me now it seemed like a really interesting new point of departure for the new work. And the works from then until almost now have been named with um, corporeal references. So that all the new works have got titles like You and I Horizontal, Between You and I, Meeting You Halfway, Breath, um, and so on. Um, and I've sort of been quite consciously encouraging those thoughts, both in myself and in the work, um, and thinking that maybe it's not too far-fetched to say that it's possible, even with a relatively abstract form like this, to describe the corporeal. And, you know, all kinds of formal things help play into that, like, well, pairs, you know. We, we, we exist, we always have pairs of things, human life. Um, we're flat, and there's backs and fronts, and so on and so forth. And um, I've, I've found that a very interesting way to uh, give myself some, trick myself into making a new, a new, a new group of works. And I think that is, um, that's narrative by, in the back door, I think. Yeah. Um, if it was, if it would do a lot for me, I'd work with colour in a shot, because it'd be very easy now with digital media. Um, but uh, I have tried it. I, I thought, what I thought it might do was enable me to have um, two uh, three-dimensional forms that were literally superimposed in the same space, but couldn't possibly be the same form. And I thought that if it should be possible, if one's orange and one's white, it should be possible for your eyes to sort of switch to one or the other and read them separately, even though they were in this occupying, uh, doing something that solid forms can't do, which is occupy the same footprint, so to speak, the same space. And uh, rather to my uh, surprise, it didn't actually work at all. It seemed like a complete muddle, just like it would have done if I'd done it all in white. And I, I did do a few more experiments, but I, in the end I concluded that it, wasn't, it didn't seem to be helpful for the way I thought and the sorts of things I was doing. So I, I didn't pursue it any further. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned in your um, upcoming piece in Australia, yeah. Crossing, yeah. Uh, that there's an audio component. Yeah. Is this a Um, funnily enough, one of the earliest pieces I did was a large uh, sonic installation, um, 1972, which I've, in recent years, I've restored, and I'm showing it, actually. Um, and I came to think about that early work again, because about five years ago, I was working on a film called, um, I call them films because it's easier, by the way projected installation is such a mouthful. <laughs> um, and I came to, I was making a piece called um, um, Leaving with Two Minute Silence. And I began, I had um, two, two uh, sound spaces created for that installation. Um, and the reason that I pursued it was because it was very important to the work that that leaving with two minutes silence had a two minute silence. And the only way you can make a silence is to first put a sound there and then remove it. And so I came at it from that angle, quite an architectural angle really. And um, then got interested in what it was that I'd been doing in 1972 with sound, which takes the form of a five channel installation. It needs a, it needs a uh, 15 meter room. And uh, what you experience is um, what appears to be an ocean wave thundering through the space and crashing down at the far end repeatedly. Um, in fact, it's entirely synthetic, made of white noise. Um, and looking at that again now has um, 
given me some courage about not being afraid of the figurative. Um, again, when I made the piece, um, I, I thought of it as an abstract piece made of white noise and a bundle of noise being something that could be sculptural too, just thinking of it in very abstract terms. And I couldn't believe when I'd remade it that I could have been so blind to what was actually going on. And I went back to my notebooks um, from the studio session when I made it and found there was a grudging reference in very small type saying, hmm, sounds like a way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a big thing. This, I mean, it's, it's like this massive space-occupying, thundering presence. And, and uh, to not quite notice is really amazing. Um, <laughs> So I'm sort of quite interested in this business of recognisable figurative noises, you know, um, because they, in a way, they get, they're like an escape hatch. Um, they create a possibility of a more narrative references, and in fact the layering of narrative references uh, within this basically very austere context of, of solid light. I think that we've got time for one more yes. question, and then we'll Something that just occurs to me is thinking of you looking at notebooks from the time yeah. and reading a thought that's in small type then now becomes incredibly apparent to you. Yeah. It, it makes me also wonder about the nature of the darkness of the spaces in which the works are shown, because in the early installations, they're clearly spaced or places that are dark. And you, you describe it. Yeah, yeah. So this is a lock, and it's dark. Mm. And the, the current pieces, the later pieces, seem much, much less like places and much more like black spaces. Mm. It's a bit of an exaggeration because each of them has a kind of characteristic yeah. kind of ceiling. But as much as it's possible, perhaps, they become, um, I don't want to say generic, almost a kind of universal. Right. So that seems like another kind of um, trajectory from um, which is perhaps moving in the opposite direction to the transition from line describing and colour to um, uh, 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 between you and I. Yeah. Um, from a kind of formality, mm. formalism to a kind of narrative. Whereas the spaces of No, it's a it's a great it's a great point. I can't I can't better it. Um, <laughs> um, I will say uh, about the the black sp the dark space though that this is it's uh, what the art historian Noam Elcott calls artificial darkness, which is to say it's not metaphorical, it's not death, it's not black, it's just darkness, and uh, which without which well photography could never have existed or or cinemas. For instance, you have the artificial darkness of the cinema, which is purely there to, to create this immersive relationship between you and the luminous screen. And so my coda to that is simply that the darkness is, is neutral, really. It's a purely physical thing, uh, which helps other, other elements um, come to life. <laughs>